to ask that you would be with me, that you would help me to preach the message that you intend to be preached, that you would protect me from error, and that you would use the word in my life and in the life of those who are in this room and are confronted with it today. And I ask that you would use it to transform our minds and our hearts and ask that you would show us what to do with what you have presented to us today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you see the title of today's sermon, it's certainly one that begs a question. Let what? Rise. Good question. It's not just one thing. You know, if, if a word has more than one meaning, two meanings, we, we call it a double entendre. By the time you get up to five or six, I don't know if you, what you call it, a quintuple entendre. Uh, but it refers to more than just one thing. But the question about what makes it rise is really going to be the question that we set out to answer today, because I think our text um, illuminates us in that. We think about the phrase. I, I like the phrase because it, it sounds to me like a like a mantra. Maybe that's not the right word. It's a little too Eastern. Um, you know, a, a call, right? An anthem. There's that's the word. Nehemiah naturally lends itself to this concept. It's the story about a guy who helped a struggling group of people build a wall that was lying in ruin. Let it rise. You can hear him saying, with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. Of course, you know it's more than just about a wall. It's about people who are in ruin. It's about a city that has become a scourge on its inhabitants. It's about a God that is supposedly worshipped in this place. And what I'm saying here today, and what I believe the text is saying, is not just that the wall needs to go up. And we recite this as our anthem. Let it rise. The nation, the people, the city, the church. Let it rise. The question that we need to answer today is, well, what does that? Because we can say that all day long. You can send troops out on the battlefield with a rousing, inspiring speech only for all of them to die. So I don't just want to say it. I want to know how this works. How does a wall get rebuilt? How do a people get lifted up? How does the name of God get vindicated? And how do people turn to him in faith? How does a nation change course? What I'm about to say is something that I've said many times. And so it will be no surprise to you and you may even want to roll your eyes. Oh, there we go again. I want to talk about the importance of faithfulness in answering that question. But I want to clarify that what I mean by faithfulness is a kind of faithfulness that is that takes into account two things. That God is sovereign and I have a role to play in that. So two things are true at the same time. The divine providence of God and human responsibility. There we go again. We see this all through the scriptures. If you recall, I used this a lot when we were going through the book of Acts. Because what we see there time and time again is the spirit of God being poured out and doing incredible things that have but one explanation. God did that. And yet God has chosen 
to pour out his spirit in flawed vessels like you and me to accomplish that work. And he expects people to respond to his revelation, to make a choice, to exercise faith, to take what they say and put it in practice. So I have a job. You have a job. And we've, we've been spilling ink over this apparent tension for 2,000 years, trying to understand how does this work? How can God predestine something that is freely chosen? And, and so sometimes we just get paralyzed, analysis paralysis, and, and we just step back and do nothing. Sometimes we try to relieve the tension by leaning hard into one side and diminishing the other. So we could lean into the divine providence and recognize that God is sovereign over all. He decrees, he declares, he predestines, he elects, and ignore the fact that, you, that there is choice, that there is free will. And then we go, well, what's the point of praying? What's the point of witnessing? What's the point of doing anything if it's all written down and then nothing gets done? Or we can lean heavily into the side of human responsibility and we become men and women of action. We want to do, not just say, but do. But if we aren't doing those things with a view of who God is and God's control and sovereignty over things, what we end up doing is working in our strength, not God's. We end up thinking that our children's unbelief depends solely on my ability to witness to them. We end up thinking that change in the culture has nothing to do with, with anything but our effort. We need the right campaign, the right marketing strategy, the right politician. Where's God in that? But time and time again, Old and New Testament alike, what I see is that two things are true at the same time. God is at work sovereignly. He intervenes. He's in control. But in that control, somehow, he includes the free will choices of sometimes pagans and his followers. Now, I, yes, I can lose sleep over it, trying to grasp it. But at the end of the day, I find tremendous peace in this. Because the fact that God is sovereign tells me I can relax, chill out. God's got it. He's in control. And there's nothing you can do. There's nothing that any other person can do to change that. And yet I also don't have to think, well, maybe nothing I do matters. And, and suffer this paralysis of, you know, do my friendships matter? Does my marriage matter? Does, does my career, does my work, does, does it matter? Well, yes, it matters. I have a divine vocation to image the very creator of the universe in my work, in my, in my music, in my speech, in my relationships. I'm making God known when I choose to follow his rules and do it his way. Everything, not just the hour that I spend here on Sunday, matters to God. All 168 hours per week matter to God. And so I find freedom in this tension that I haven't fully figured out how it works. God's in control. At the same time, my choices matter. And so I believe when we, when we let these things both inform our perspective, this produces biblical faithfulness. And that's the answer to the question, how it rises. Biblical faithfulness that is inspired by both divine providence and human responsibility. Well, as I work through the text, we're going to identify different things that are being raised. And the first one, the first heading I have for the first few verses here is petitions that are raised. Read along with me in the beginning of Nehemiah 2. In the month of Nisan, 
that's January, more than likely, and we're probably in 445 BC. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, you'll recall from last week, or if you weren't, I'll, I'll remind you or, or tell you that we learned last week that Nehemiah is the cupbearer of the king, which is a, not just a low-level service job. This is actually a pretty high-ranking service job. This puts him in the inner circle of the king. And when he heard the bad report about what had, ha had happened to his people in the beloved city, he was broken by it. He cries out to God. He seeks counsel from God. And chapter 1 ends with Nehemiah having resolved to bring the matter to the king. What you have to understand is actually potentially a life-threatening resolution. You don't go to the king and ask him for things if you haven't been asked. And you definitely don't ask the king to issue a decree that counters the decree that he issued some time ago, especially in this culture. But he has resolved, after consulting with the Lord, to go to the king and to make his petition known. So the occasion presents itself. He's at a banquet of, of sorts. And he does his job, right? He tastes the wine. And he doesn't die. Okay, I guess God has me here for a reason. And then he says, now I had not been sad in his presence. And by the way, that's because that was a massive breach of etiquette. You know, the king needed to, to know that everybody in his kingdom was happy, right? And so if you were in his presence, smiles, right? You better put it on your smile for the king. But this week, he's got a countenance about him that the king can tell something's not right with Nehemiah. What's he going to say? Well, the king said to me, why is your face sad? Saying that you're not sick. This is nothing but sadness of the heart. I don't know if he's condescending. Like saying, you aren't sick, cheer up. Or if he really cares. I think he might really care, actually. Based on what he's gonna, we're going to see here soon. But then, as, but then Nehemiah says, then I was very much afraid. Isn't it interesting? He's afraid that he's just been asked the king, hey, what's wrong? Because he knows this is his moment. After, after prayer, chapter 1, he has resolved to take this matter to the king. And the king has just asked him, what's the matter, Nehemiah? This is it. So now he's got to choose. If he's, did he really hear God tell him to do that? And so he's afraid. Now, I looked into this a little bit and I found, I, I think, there is a tiny, tiny little sliver of legal hope for Nehemiah. If you go back to Ezra 4, which we talked about last week, that decree is recorded for us there. And there is a phrase that seems to indicate that Artaxerxes left himself a loophole. He decreed, all right, cease and desist, unless I say otherwise. Okay, so Nehemiah's got this tiny legal hope that maybe he can ask the king to go back on his decree because he left that open for himself. In that culture, that's a big deal because even the king cannot violate the laws of the Medes and Persians. We read in verse 3, I said to the king, here it is, here's his moment, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city the place of my father's graves lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. That had to be short, probably silent. Can you imagine? King, most powerful human ruler on the earth. What are, what are you asking? Father, would you tell me, you know? So, so this is a man who knows he can speak to the Lord through fasting and prayer for many days at a time. But he can also, quick sentence in silence, consult God. And that's what he does. So I prayed to the God of heaven. 
And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. This is a huge ask. It's interesting. He didn't reveal at the very beginning what city he was talking about. And when he says, what's wrong with you? He just says, my people are in ruin. Why wouldn't I be sad? It's only here that he's started to reveal the specifics of what land, what people he might be referring to. I need to go to Judah to rebuild. So there's something about his personal testimony, apparently, that endears himself to the king. He didn't go straight for politics. He just shared his personal testimony. But the thing that I want to lift out of this before we move on to the next section is the order of Nehemiah's petitions. Now, he left chapter 1 resolved to petition the king to fix the situation. But when the moment came, what did he do first? He prayed. So there are two petitions that I see in this text. Not one, two, and the order matters. Nehemiah, we have learned twice already, and we will continue, is a man of prayer. Now, characteristically, we think of Nehemiah as like this man of action, all right? He doesn't want to say things. He wants to do things, right? Ezra's the preacher, right? Nehemiah is the construction manager, and yet, even though he's a man of action, he consults the Lord first. So he raises his petition to the God of heaven, and then he raises his petition to, we might say in some little g sense, God of the earth. But the order matters. Next, beginning in verse 6, we see that support is raised. Support, that is, for Nehemiah's cause. Verse 6. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone? Will, will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. So Nehemiah never tells us what time that is. But the, the basic idea is the king's like, well, Nehemiah, you're kind of important to me. How long is this going to take? Nehemiah doesn't tell us what he told him, but he did give him an answer. And he said, basically, I answered him. I told him how long it would be. And he's like, okay, you can go. He just wanted to know he was going to come back. He needed someone drinking that wine before he did. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river. So, so understand what he's asking. This, this phrase, province beyond the river, I've pointed this out several times, that's, that's the technical term for the geopolitical area under the Persian Empire. That's, that's what it's called. So he's saying, give me letters that I can give to those people, those local rulers that say, you are, give, you are authorizing me to do this work. So he's asking for political support from the king. Why? that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and also a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. That's like saying, not just trees out in that field, but the king's field. Back me up, king, with your money, with your lumber. I need them, why? Because I need timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked. For the good hand of my God was upon me. So he got his legal backing. He got his financial backing. But the key, in my view, is, is what, how Nehemiah interprets what just happened. He tells us, the king granted me what I asked for the good hand of my God. 
So it's the hand of the king, you might say, right? He's getting, he's asked for documents that give him legal and financial support. But when he sums it all up, what just happened, it's the hand of the king. We might say human agents, but more importantly, and primarily, it's the hand of the Lord. You see? Human responsibility, human agency, and the sovereignty of God. So Nehemiah leaves this encounter with the king knowing full well God's at work here. So he arrives. And in verse 9, it should not surprise us, we are going to see tension is raised. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river. Now keep in mind, these are people that Artaxerxes has, has he has given letters to, him, to Nehemiah to hand to these very people. Then I came to the governor's province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent the officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sambalat and Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. That's a harsh phrase, isn't it? These are the people that are in charge of this land. And they are ticked that the king has authorized someone to come in here and seek the welfare of these people. This is anti-Semitism. It's interesting to me that not only does he have this financial backing, but he has these horses and officers of the army. So there's a military backing. So, so we add legal funding, or I should say legal backing, financial funding, but also military support. And the reason this is interesting to me is because in Ezra, Ezra had this great show of faith to the king. When, when he petitioned the king, and he says, you know, the God of heaven will protect us, and I don't need your armies, I don't need anything. And then he's like, oh my goodness, that's a long trip. And there's 2,000 of us. What am I going to do? Well, I can't go back to the king with my tail between my eyes or legs. I told him that I didn't need him. And he refused to ask. And yet Nehemiah, when he's given military support, is like, yeah, God's at work. Isn't that interesting? You know, which one's right? Yes. Now, one of the reasons that, or one of the things I hope to get out of our series in, in Ezra and Nehemiah is that you'll understand the New Testament better. Because narratively speaking, this is how the Old Testament wraps up. This is the last story. And, and you ever notice how when you get to the Gospels, there's like a whole new political system? Pharisees and Sadducees never read about those in the Old Testament, right? It's a new empire. It's not Persia anymore. It's Rome by then. And it has to go through Greece before it gets there. There's a lot that goes on in that 400-year period. And there's a whole new geopolitical uh, and social world right? by the time the New Testament comes on the scene. But the roots of those changes can be seen in Ezra and Nehemiah. And so I, I want to look at this. So I think we can rightfully think of these two guys, Sam Ballot and Tobiah, as I'll say proto Samaritan. You know who the Samaritans are if you've read the New Testament. And you know that the Jews and the Samaritans do not get along. Well, the reason they do not get along is because of the stories that we are reading in Ezra and Nehemiah. If you go back another 300 years in the 700s BC, you may recall that it was the northern kingdom uh, of Israel that was taken uh, over by Assyria. And Assyria came in as the global big bad, and they just scattered them all over the world. But they had a policy of when they would do that, when they would conquer peoples, is that they would take some of them and move them to some other part of the kingdom, and then transport. They just liked to do this all around because they wanted to water down their belief systems. They wanted to create a kind of pluralistic society where everyone could sort of have their own religion and gods. 
but not be too, you know, strict about it. And so what happened is, and you can read about this in 2 Kings 17, because we actually have an account of the, these early inhabitants. These people had been brought into the land of Israel and Judah, and there's a, some Jews left behind, like ethnic Jews. And over time, we're about 300 years later now, there's, there's sort of a new culture emerging. It's sort of half Jewish. And so they are somewhat predisposed to including a lot of the religious elements of what we would now call Judaism, but, but the, the Old Testament religious system. In fact, the whole story of Jesus and the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, is about their religious differences, right? The woman's like, well, the Jews say that we're supposed to worship there, but my people say we're supposed to worship there. By the way, they're talking about the same God. They both believe in Torah. But the peoples did not get along. The Samaritans, for the most part, rejected the works of prophecy and just wanted to follow Torah and do it their own way. So what's, what's happening here, is, and we've seen these early victories, we talked about that in Ezra 4, where the heads of household have the wisdom and the courage to resist this Samaritan syncretistic impulse. Do you know what I mean? The, the impulse to say, you do your thing, we'll do our thing, we'll just sort of all blend it in together and, and just have this new, create a new society together with a new vision. And they're like, no. Yahweh and Yahweh alone is the one that we are called to be loyal to. And we will not compromise. And these people who wanted to just sort of get along with everybody were like, yeah. That's not how we do it. We're more progressive than that. We've moved on from those tribal ways of thinking. And so, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. And that's why we encounter those tensions by the time we get to the New Testament. And I want to point this out. Historical documents point us to something. 38 years after the events described here, Sambila is identified as the governor of Samaria. So, so whatever defeats he might face in this, today's text, the rest of the story, is that he's going to end up the governor of this area. Which is sad. Tobiah has a Jewish name, but he's Ammonite. Right? Ammonites were on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And if you know your Old Testament, you know that Israel and the Ammonites, they had a few skirmishes. So he's sort of half Jew. And, and even Sambalot, he has a Babylonian name, but his kids, uh, we know from other places, had Jewish names. Right? So there's this blending going on. And they... It's like when, when Ezra and Nehemiah and the exiles return to the land, they're kind of thinking, you will assimilate into our culture or we won't get along, right? But the Jews that God has brought back are not willing to do it. They are resisting this impulse to syncretize their religions. They refuse. At the end of the day, they recognize that they have a responsibility before Yahweh. To stand for something. Some things can't be mixed. You know, sometimes there we go back and forth. We're trying to figure out a path, the best way of thinking, and you've got a perspective here and a perspective here. And we might go, well, what's in the middle? And maybe that third way, as it's sometimes called, is the right way. Maybe we need these competing voices to balance us out. But sometimes we have to say, no, it's this and this alone. And that's what we see in these faithful exiles. It's Yahweh and Torah and the prophets alone. And we will not compromise. And this, and I want to, this is again the thing that I want to pull out before I move on. This taking a stand is, I think, that we can equate with seeking the welfare of the people of Israel. Right? That's what these people, these syncretists, don't want them to do. They do not want them to seek the welfare of the people.
But what I'm saying is that these, these faithful exiles demonstrate that in order to seek the welfare of God's people, they must stand for something and not compromise. We, we could use that lesson today, I think. Next, we, read, we see in verse 11, plans are raised. Uh, Sean, I'm going to use that picture I sent you if you want to go ahead and pull that up in just a second. Let's go ahead and read the text. Verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. And then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the horn on which I rode. So Nehemiah decides to go on this scouting mission. Right? He's doing a little reconnaissance. And he decides, you know, I don't want anybody to see me. So he doesn't take any men with him. No, no herd of animals, just the one that he's on. And he decides to do this thing under the cover of, of night in secret. You think he's afraid? That's not it. This is, this is the man that had the courage to ask the king to fund his mission from his private accounts. This, this is not fear. This is wisdom. This is him going, you know what? I need to understand before I act. I want to know what's going on here. And the only reason I feel justified in making this point is that we're going to see, we're going to get some clarification on this as we go, that Nehemiah does research. And the more he begins to understand, he then starts to reveal his plan. He's figuring it out. So we might say he's, you know, taking responsibility. Right? The hand of the Lord is at work, but he's got work to do too. I went out by night, by the valley. I'm going to read this, this section all through verse um, 16. And then I'm going to try to describe, uh, get you oriented a little bit with that picture. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dumb gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. And then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool. But there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. You see, by the time he does this reconnaissance, he's got a plan, but he doesn't tell anybody just yet. I got a couple of reasons that I want to show you this picture. One of them is because if you know where to look, Nehemiah has described a, a path in, in that, that you can see in that picture. But the other one was because I took that picture exactly one year ago today. <laughs> That's my phone standing on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is east of the city, so I'm looking west. If you look over to the very right of the screen, you'll see... Um, the Dome of the Rock, the mosque that stands there up on the Temple Mount. As you move to the left, you see how there's another wall kind of going away from you? Uh, right there, that would be the uh, southern steps, right? When, when Jesus has this encounter as a 12-year-old boy, you know, where he's teaching the people, he's probably standing on those steps. When Peter preaches his sermon in Acts 2, good chance he's standing on those steps. And then you see how there's kind of a hill going down to the left. And you can see that there's, a, there's some architecture that points you in that direction. And that's going down towards the ancient city of David. Right, so about a thousand years before the time of Christ, that's where David dwelt. Now if you look at the bottom of the picture, you see some, a hill that's going up. Now if you go... Further enough to the east, you go, yeah, I can walk up that. But if you go all the way over to the west, it's very steep. So what Nehemiah has just described, he comes to the town uh, as though he's coming towards me in this picture. And he, and he hits on the southwest side 
uh, of an area. He goes and he, and he describes this whole passage here, right? Where he goes to the valley gate that's on the southwestern side of the city. And then he makes a southward course around the ancient city of David. And he, and he encounters the serpent or the dragon well, and then the dung gate. And I want to highlight what the dung gate is. The dung gate is the southernmost tip of this ancient city. And it is the way to a, a valley called the Hinnom Valley. The New Testament word for Hinnom is Gehenna. Does that get any of your wheels turning? This is one of the words that's used to describe, what we'll say, the bad place in the afterlife. It's the place where in the ancient world, and to some extent today, as we saw it, you would go and you would throw your trash. And if you went back far enough, it was a place of where many of the ancient um, human sacrifices were done. It's a place of ancient evil, and it's right there where David's palace was, looking out over that ancient site of evil. And then the Illini turns up slightly north, coming around the eastern, so in, in your picture, traveling east. And he gets to the fountain gate, the king's pool, and there he's going aside that Kidron Valley, like I said, which is very steep, and so steep that his animal can't handle it. So he goes on foot for a little ways, exploring the old city of David, and apparently I, he's figured out what he needs to know, and he walks back and leaves the way he came. And I just wanted to sort of show you that. That's his plan. All right, he's seen it. He knows what he's up for. Now, he's got a plan, but he doesn't share it with anybody. But he's got to do that, right? He can't do this himself. So the next thing he's got to do is he's got to recruit. And that's what we see is next, that courage is raised. Verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? How Jerusalem lies in ruin with its gates burned? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. What's he saying? He's saying, let's do something. And to get you to believe that what I'm saying is worth doing, let me tell you about how good God has been to me. Let me testify to the fact that I know that God is doing this, that he is at work, that the hand of the good Lord is upon me. So because of his sovereignty, let's do something. I told them about the hand, of, look at these phrases, the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. What's he saying? He's saying, guys, I know this sounds crazy. I know that our city lies in ruin. It's been devastated, but I think we should build it. And I know you think I'm crazy, but I have two big reasons to think that it can be done. God's work and the king's work. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility. You see? The hand of God and the hand of the king signing these documents, authorizing it. And so because he points the people to the divine sovereignty of God and his goodness and the mercy of the king to, to dispose himself to them in this way, we get a pretty positive response. Really? God's doing that? Really? The king wrote that letter? And he's funding it from his private treasury of trees? Wow. And they said, let us rise up and build. Their city has been destroyed, burned, and ruined. And now the people are rising up to do something about it. And so they strengthened their hands for the good work. 
I love Nehemiah's argument. I love it. Because it's primarily focused on God's reputation. I mean, he basically, you know, I, I'm, I'm a fan of this. Let's, let's look at things the way they really are. Let's not pretend that life is easy when it's hard or beautiful when it's ugly. Hardship happens. It's real. Life is pain, as I often say. And he's like, look, guys, do you see this? This is terrible. And, and, and I don't want to suffer this derision anymore. What does that mean for him? It means our God's reputation is on the hook when his people and his city are lying in ruin. It's Yahweh that gets defamed. And I can't stand for that anymore. So men, let's rise up and build the wall. And so his appeal depends primarily on the glory of God. It appeals to his providential goodness, the hand of God, which I've already recognized. It appeals to the king's humanitarian goodness, the hand of the king in signing these documents. And so the people respond to an argument that recognizes both the sovereignty of God and the necessity of human responsibility. And they, with one voice, say, let's rise up and build. And they strengthen their hands to do the good work. Finally, the last two verses, the final thing is raised. I need to make a change. Just add one letter. God is not merely raised. He is praised. Verse 19. But when Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Yemenite, Servan and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it. They jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will arise and build. You see, Nehemiah's courage has become the courage of men. And they add, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Can you imagine walking into a city and telling the mayor, you have no right or claim or portion in this place anymore? That's an incredible statement. Now we meet a third villain, we might say, Geshem the Arab. He's a ruler. And he's well testified to outside of the scriptures of the land to the south of Jerusalem. We, we know that with these other two that are mentioned, who are Samaritan, they have dominion, if you will, in the area of Jerusalem and the north, and the other one, Jerusalem, and to the east. So now we've got the Arab from the south also with an interest in this land. Does this sound like familiar at all with the tensions surrounding that city? People from every direction saying, no, this is ours. So, so we have three people, not kings, but, but powerful political leaders wanting to stake their claim on this place. And once again, the people of God are surrounded by people that want them dismissed and killed and not to even enjoy decent welfare. I think I read that in the news last night. Not only did I love Nehemiah's argument to these people, I love the way he responds to his opponents here, right? So he's given an argument to his kin, to the people of God, to, to help produce a kind of courage in them. But now he's got to face his enemies. And, and they come and they say, all right, what are you doing? Are you going against the king? You can't do that. So they appeal to their higher authority. You can't go against the king. Now, keep this in mind. Nehemiah has an ace up his sleeve, right? He's got letters 
that were written by the king to him, to these people and say, yeah, he can do it. He has letters that were to go to the guy that runs the, the lumber yard and say, yeah, give them what they need. And yet, when he's challenged by his enemies, he doesn't play that card. I, I think that's so fascinating. He could say, no, the law is actually on my side. The king is actually on my side and we enjoy his support. No, he takes the moment to point to the thing that they really need to know. That what's happening now is not happening because of a man that's 900 miles away. What's happening is because the God of heaven is at work. And he has authorized us to do this work. And we will be successful. Take that. And they add to it. Not only will the God of heaven make us prosper. And we will arise and build. You see it there again. God at work. We're at work too. But you. You have no portion. No right. And no claim. That is an incredible, totalizing claim to say to these people. And if you look into these words, you'll find that what they're, what they're addressing here is not just their legal claim, but their spiritual claims, their religious claims. The word here in Hebrew that's in, in our text, um, claim, or right or claim, is actually the word that's most often translated as remembrance or memorial. And it's a word that is used when you are going through a religious uh, procedure and you are remembering something. You're claiming this thing about past. So, so what he's actually saying is, you have no portion, that's an inheritance, you have no right, that's a legal thing, and you have no heritage. No spiritual heritage, no legal heritage, no political heritage. None of those things give you a right to tell us what to do. We have all of those things. That's, that's an incredible statement. They're saying we are the people of God. We are the rightful citizens of this place. The God of heaven is on our side. Our Xerxes is on our side. We've got the financial backing, the military support. You know what we call this? The sovereign hand of the Lord. And we are going to rise up and make it happen. Now, I want to wrap this up by turning to the Psalms. And I'm going to go ahead, if you don't mind, maybe for sentimental reasons, read this out of the Bible that I purchased in that city. I want to read Psalm 20. If you don't know that one by number, you've heard me recite a portion of it quite frequently. And I will recite it quite frequently at Worldly Wednesday this semester. But I want to read the whole psalm. It's not that long. And have this sort of help us bring our, our time here in the scriptures to a close and tie it all together. Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. I can just imagine, and this is written by David, I, I can imagine maybe Nehemiah thinking about this song as he walks around the city of David. May the Lord grant you all your requests. And what does Nehemiah ask for? Everything. Now this, I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. That's the word from, that's Messiah, that's Christ. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary. That's why Nehemiah keeps asserting that their God is the God of heaven. With the victorious power of his right hand, 
Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's why Nehemiah doesn't respond to his enemies by saying, oh, by the way, I've got the legal back of the king. He responds to his political opponent by saying, the God of heaven authorized me. Because he doesn't trust in chariots, which he's been given. Or horses, or officers. He trusts in the name of Yahweh. And they are brought to their knees and fall. But we rise up and stand firm. Let it rise, baby. And Lord, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. At the end of the day, Nehemiah does not have his hope in the king. He does not have his hope in the law. He does not have his king in the military, his hope in the military. He does not have his hope in lumber or materials or horses. He doesn't have his hope in the will of the people. He doesn't have his hope in his own wisdom or courage or personality or charisma. He doesn't have his hope in his strategy, in his carefully thought out, meticulously implemented plan. His hope is in the God of heaven. And for that reason, it's time to use all of those things. The law, the will of the people, the finances, the raw materials, the plans, the strategies, for the glory of God to accomplish his good work. So I hope you see that in some sense, this text has helped us answer that question. When we think of the church in 2024, trying to, trying to think of a proper response to the insanity of our world, to the depravity of our world, to the defeat that we often feel, as we walk through it as pilgrims. And we, and we want to call the church to action, to respond, to confront the spirit of the age, to stand up, to be courageous, to, to even purify the very church itself. That we only do that and we can only have success in doing that if we do it in view of the fact that God is sovereign and he expects us to respond. So, so it doesn't depend on us. Lord, thank you. But it doesn't happen without us either. That's the way God planned it. God made us, I believe, in part for this. I think it's even very, it's connected to what it means to be created in his image. He wants us to represent him with the work of our hands, with the words of our lips and the affections of our hearts. And we can turn up a lot of dust we can read a lot of books and try to figure things out and whiteboard our way out of any problem. It doesn't work if God's not at work. But we are still are called to be people of action. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? God's got it. It's in his hands. But that doesn't mean we sit on ours. Let's pray. Father, I want to ask that you would fill us with the joy of the Lord. It's this very 
leader who will embolden the hearts of his people with, with that anthem, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Father, I have no doubt that many of us have already, are currently and will face trials, disappointment, pain, suffering. And you have called us to action. Even when the only thing we want to do is just sit on our hands and wait for it to end. So Lord, I ask that as we are wrestling with our own fear, doubt, with our pride, with, with our anger, that you restore to us the joy of our salvation, that you remind us of your goodness, that you teach us about the beauty of the plan that you have already set in motion and ends with the seated coronated king of the heaven on the earth and establishing a place where the God of heaven and his offspring walk in unity forever. Lord, we cling to that hope today. And I ask that you would help us to be effective ambassadors of the coming King for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name.